Lemon, lime, and a drop of cherry make a simple Shirley. But what happens when Tito's handmade vodka reveals this sweet sipper's dirty secret? Stir up a Tito's dirty Sherlock and crack the case with Tito's at titosvodka.com. 40% alcohol by volume, namely 80 proof, crafted to be savored responsibly. Mom, Dad, you should shop Amazon for back to school and save some money. See, I'm currently obsessed with superheroes and need all the superhero stuff. Superhero lunchbox, superhero backpack. But next year, it'll be something else. Maybe dinosaurs? I don't know. I'm not a fortune teller. But I can tell you not to spend a fortune and shop low prices for school on Amazon. Okay, good chat. Amazon. Spend less, smile more. To get the Crime Writers on After Show right now, go to patreon.com slash partners in crime media. I'm Rebecca Lavoy, and this is Crime Writers On. Crime Writers On is the original true crime review podcast that digs in a true crime, pop culture, other podcasts. And on this episode, was a Cold War rock song actually a piece of CIA propaganda? We'll rewind the cassette to our 2020 review of Wind of Change. Joining me to get that done and more is true crime author, TV journalist, and host of These Are Their Stories podcast, my husband, and love of my life, Kevin Flynn. Hi, Kevin. Hello, Rebecca. Are you a piece of CIA propaganda? <laughs> Am I? No. No, I, I mean, I don't You're terrible I don't think at it so. if you are. I have not been convinced to do anything. I, I am what the, uh, the Russian intelligence agencies would call a uh, useful idiot. <laughs> a bad asset? But no, but, you know, <laughs> there are people that can be manipulated into doing I know what certain that things, means. but no, 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 no. We're actually going back to hear our uh, CWO Classic Rewind. We're going back to May 2020. We were just getting comfortable staying home mm. and finding things to do. And our puppy was barking. All our the time. puppy was barking, and the weather was getting nice. So you could stand out, you could sit outside and wonder I wonder if this pandemic is ever going to end. In the meantime, I'm going to plug in my earphones, my earbot, my AirPod, whatever, I'll stick the things in my ears, mm-hmm. and I'm going to listen to the podcast Wind of Change, brought to you by Spotify, Pineapple Street, and Crooked Media. And it featured the host, Patrick Radden Keefe, who is a very famous nonfiction author and journalist, too. journalist, yep. uh, just a, a, a podcast and like anything that I think we'd heard before or since. Also featured the Scorpions. A lot of the Scorpions. <laughs> All right. Should we take a listen? Jump in. Moving on. And then you wrote <laughs> Wikipedia. I think that's a command. You're like telling me to Wikipedia. <laughs> Wikipedia, Scorpions, Wind of Change. The song is remembered as an anthem to the fall of communism in Europe. But was it more than just a catchy power ballad? This song had been written by the CIA and had been a part of a PSYOPs campaign. Psychological operation. Exactly. To what? To insert this song, this music into... The Soviet Union to encourage change. (laughs) In the podcast Wind of Change from Spotify, Pineapple Street, and Crooked Media, reporter Patrick Radden Keefe investigates the claims from within the CIA that they were responsible for the Scorpions' iconic hit. The implication being Wind of Change was not an artistic commentary on the end of the Cold War, but a piece of Western propaganda designed to weaken Soviet influence. The idea that there are other stories he could tell, but not this one, because this one's too important, too secret. It's the story that can't be told. Leave me feeling strangely energized, like we're onto something, like there's something real here. And we have to figure it out. Keith recalls the backstory of the song, CIA tradecraft involving the entertainment world and the colorful characters surrounding the band who got them to that moment in history. The first few episodes of Wind of Change are out on all the platforms, but you can binge all eight episodes on the Spotify app. We're going to be talking about plot points for the entirety of the series Wind of Change. So to remain spoiler free, go to the estimated time code in our show notes for our thumbs up or thumbs down review. Toby, this podcast is a journey. 
Is it not? Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about that? I think it's good. I mean, I, it has a nice pace to it. And I think part of it is that Patrick Radden Keefe, like after his, his big break in the deep dive, which brought him to the nation, <laughs> he's done a really nice job. No, he's, he's a very amiable narrator. And I think, you know, they, they go on a lot of tangents and they're, you know, a few kind of dead endish type things, but they're all interesting. And I think they all sort of have a point, even if the point isn't necessarily ultimately going to help answer the main question, which is, did the CIA write or have something to do with Wind of Change? Uh, but you, you end up sort of interacting with all these sort of interesting characters and hearing these crazy stories. And he, he just touches upon a whole bunch of different subjects that are involved in some way in this sort of greater story of that song and then the uh, two-day festival, sort of light metal festival in Moscow. So I, I thought it, I thought it was really, really well done. It's part of it, I was thinking, like, how many more hours of stuff does he have when he was, like, kind of trying to chase things down that didn't end up being, like, quite interesting enough to make it into the podcast? Mm. But, you know, he must have talked to so many other people just based on sort of these odd characters who he does end up talking to that they, I, I assume they kept the audio in because the, the stories are good. I thought the same thing, Toby. And, Kevin, one of the things I kept thinking when I was listening to this podcast is... They spent a lot of money making this podcast in travel, in music licensing. Like one of those tangents, like Toby was just referencing, they leave some of these oddball tangents in. Like the one I think about is the G.I. Joe convention. They went to this convention. Right. The guy they wanted to talk to wasn't there. So they ended up calling him. But they spent money to travel to and go to this thing with the hopes of meeting that guy. Like, this was not an amateur-level production by any stretch of the imagination, right? Yeah, I don't know why they needed necessarily to go to the the Ukraine to be there for a concert. Why not? Why not? Spotify was paying for it. Why would you not do that? It's all that special Gimlet money. (laughs) Spotify money. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the G.I. Joe thing was a little... (laughs) Because the guy had a post... His fan fiction, his Scorpion fan fiction characters, characters that he made, yeah, out of GI Joe figurines. I don't know, but, <laughs> but there were a couple of side stories that were really interesting along the way, and it, and you know the wife of Tony Mendez, I forget her name, but oh, he was how sexist. By the way, right now in my mind, I don't remember her name either. Although I did write it down on another piece of paper, but I don't think calling her the wife of Tony Mendez. We should just say. That amazing disguise lady from the CIA. Disguise lady. <laughs> who we know because she was married to Tony Mendez, which was the lead character in Argo. Yes. You know, the whole thing about the disguises and how she wore a disguise to go meet with President Bush. Yes. Uh, because he had been the, George H.W. Bush had been ahead of the CIA. And so he starts talking about the disguises that apparently he had to wear. Yes. When he was in the CIA. Yes. To go meet with people in China, right? That she just, like, does a Mission Impossible thing and rips the latex off her face. Like, that's fucking awesome. Yeah. Laura, do you think this is a podcast about whether or not the CIA wrote the song? Or is it a podcast about the CIA? I mean, I learned so much about the CIA listening to this podcast, didn't you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But I, I do think it is about the song and that time in history and, you know, how that relates to the CIA, whether or not... They were operating at that time with regard to like what was going on with this song, but just how they were operating at that time in history and the stories of what was going on and the people that were involved. And like, you know, the Scorpions had that guy that was like traveling around with them who um, or no, it was the nitty gritty dirt band. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it is that is the jumping off point for the story. And I but I do think they keep that thread of the story pretty consistent with regard to the song and the Scorpions throughout But the side benefit is you're learning a lot about what the CIA was or was not doing at that time and how it operates, even with regard to like Freedom of Information Act requests. So Mm. there was a lot of extra information that went along with following up on the the overall question of this podcast. I will say the other thing this podcast and I you know, I love this. I love when journalists talk about how they do journalism Mm -hmm. and like things about journalism. I know that most people don't know how journalism works. And that whole series of um, you know scenes about FOIA and how it works and the kind of responses you get back and then the, or, the origins of Glomar, the why we can either confirm nor deny. Like, 
I listened to that and my heart sung because I'm like, people do not know how this works and that there is actually an origin story behind we can't confirm or deny thing. To me, those that kinds of That was an episode details, of uh, Radio Lab. I know, but they sing. Those things sing yeah. to me. Like, I just, I love that stuff so, so much. Now, Kevin, uh, you made a pretty, like, bold comparison when you were first listening to this podcast. I think you're only a couple episodes in, and you made a comment to me, and I'd oh, like sure. to give you the chance to say what you said about this podcast. I said this might be the serial of music history podcasts. Okay, why is that? It shares a lot with the Sarah Koenig narrative of the first person uh, journalism. And, you know, the idea that uh, there's an interest, is there a story here? And in that way, it's certainly different than a lot of things that we've ever listened to. And there was quality all along. Every time we sort of went into a different direction to talk about music history or uh, CIA tradecraft or let's find out more about Doc McGee and his drug dealing ways with Manuel Noriega. Each each of these uh, little uh, vignettes it told really really well. Yeah. So Toby, I have a question for you. I mean, Henry actually, our producer, sent me some notes about the podcast because I asked him to because I knew he the whole time I was listening to this, I was like, oh my god, Henry's going to love everything about this. So he sent me some notes about it, and one of the notes that um. He sent me is he actually knows a lot about that like CIA propaganda music program. But what we hear in the podcast is this sort of unwitting uh, way that a lot of people were used and their art was used by the CIA. You know, one of the things we hear in this podcast is that Scorpion's music was popular throughout the other side of the Iron Curtain, as we sort of hear them say, which is really funny, by the way, on the other side, they call us the other side of the Iron Curtain, which is great. But anyway, that it was by these tapes being spread like hand to hand. And Toby, I was wondering if you wondered what I wondered, like, maybe the CIA just did that. Maybe they were just helping people hand tapes out. What do you think about this propaganda stuff and how it actually worked besides the Nina Simone story and the Louis Armstrong story that we heard? I I just thought that the stuff that he laid out, it was pretty clear that the, the CIA didn't do anything creative. You know, they, they, they weren't really involved in making art, but what they were good at was recognizing what art could be influential uh, in sort of advancing the American cause and then either explicitly or through subterfuge, getting those artists to bring their art where they wanted them to. In the in the end, like I kind of felt throughout the thing, he was making the case that they probably didn't write the song. Like it was probably like legitimately a Scorpion song, but that they recognized what they could do with it and then, you know, help distribute it, like you were saying, uh, behind the Iron Curtain. And blowing it up, I don't know if this is part of the thing, but, you know, if they would have helped put their finger on the scale for the scenes that are in the video of the Berlin Wall coming down and stuff, like that to me seems like another piece of something that the CIA would be like, all right, let's just make this as explicit as possible what this song is about. But I I actually listened to the audio book of uh, the Chivago Affair. The Kremlin, the CIA, and the battle over a forbidden book. So they printed 10,000 copies of a Russian language edition of the book to be smuggled back into the USSR. It was only a few years ago that the CIA finally declassified the files, boasting, and I'm quoting here, that the whole episode shows how soft power can influence events. The book for which I was named after Toby. (laughs) Exactly. That didn't come up actually in this, I don't think. (laughs) Yeah. Big glaring hole. Ah, come on, Tobes. But uh, Patrick Radden Keefe like brings up Dr. Zhivago as, you know, one of the big examples of the CIA kind of exploiting art for its uses. And it's, it's a super interesting book about the lengths the CIA had to go to to like smuggle it out and then smuggle it back in. And it's a little recommendation. So I don't really have a wrap up other than to say I don't think they wrote it for him. <laughs> well, Laura, though, I mean, speaking of the power of the song, talk about your memory of Wind of Change, because it actually directly ties to what Toby was just saying. Oh, yeah. So I have this friend, Mary, that I grew up with, you know, somebody that was in all my elementary school, like, yeah, and I had a small school and her mom 
had uh, like one of the stories she talked about a lot, her mom escaping from Germany when she was a child and how she like got out of Germany hiding under like a pile of potatoes on this potato cart. And that's how she escaped. So when this song came out and Mary was always listening to all the hair bands as well, she was like incessantly listening to the song, but she was listening to the song and, and it was like when the Berlin Wall was coming down and she was talking about like her mom's experience getting out of Germany and then like, you know, so there was this song that she was always listening to, and then she was always listening to that like ninety nine Luft Balloon song as well. <laughs> yeah. But it's like burned in my memory. Like I remember like sitting in her house listening to this song. And so it's like one of those like where were you when type things when I hear it. And so then that sent me down like this whole rabbit hole last weekend, my poor family, because I got on my iTunes and I started like, oh, what was the other songs I loved? I'm like, oh, every rose has its thorn. And I was like running on the house <laughs> singing it. Poison. And I was like, oh, yeah. I was like, man, Guns and Roses. It was like opening up this whole window of nostalgia, um, all these songs that we were listening to. So, yeah. I do love the music critic they talked to from Florida who does a little takedown of hair bands, <laughs> which is like, these are just pretty boys singing pop songs, like pretending that they're cool. <laughs> it was pretty good. Now, Kevin, I want to talk about the framing of the first episode, because I think we maybe experienced it differently. I thought it was brilliant. At the beginning of the episode, we hear Michael, uh, Patrick Radkeef's friend, who, by the way, is like so mysterious and cool, mm-hmm. uh, calling Oliver, the fake named ex-CIA guy. And I know that it would be difficult for you to tell it on the record, but I'm wondering if you would do it with like, um, you know, a different name and a scratchy voice and, and be interviewed. Right. Of course. Yeah. 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 No, that's true. Understood. Don't want that to happen. I do not want you to go to jail. I do not want you to be arrested under felony charges or even worse. We hear the phone call again at the end. We actually hear more of the phone call at the end. And we hear this whole episode in between that frames why or why not Oliver may want to get involved or not. And that's where we hear a lot of like the basics about like post-CIA life. I thought the framing of that episode and the writing of it was so, so good. And I see here in your notes, you're like... I don't need to hear that phone call twice. Are we going to have to fight about this? I, I, out of this whole podcast? <laughs> that's what you want to no, take let's, me down? Broader about? question. The writing is yeah. so good, is it not? It is. It's a good choice to start there. Yeah. You know, with you know the emissary trying to find out from, is he Greybeard or was this guy heard it from Greybeard? He heard or, it from Greybeard, yeah. The fact that the rumor comes from within the CIA gives the rumor standing because, uh, you know, there's a lot of rumor in Son of a Hitman, but it just is like conspiracy theory mm. stuff, right? And on its own, this would be kind of a ridiculous theory, but the fact that it comes from within the CIA and that it's just believable enough, it's not, it's not as outrageous. It, there's this like this, it's this it's truthiness. It's sticky. Yeah, there's this truthiness to it that there's a legitimacy here to this quest. Yeah. You know what's interesting? It was actually very interesting listening to these two podcasts in the same week. Yeah. Because one of them was so well sourced and had so much information. Patrick Rad and Keith even talks about the difference between like a CIA agent and a CIA officer. And then you uh-huh. hear in the other podcast we review talking about just like operatives. Like they're everyone. Like everyone's an operative. And I'm like, no. Like, read a book like Patrick Red and Keefe did. Like, that's not what that word means. It's just very interesting, the contrast between the thoroughness and believability. Because even Michael, who is just Patrick Red and Keefe's friend, he does such a good job laying the groundwork for why Michael is somebody that we can sort of trust because I trust him. Mm-hmm. It's very, very compelling and convincing when he's like... He's given me like 90% of my story ideas and he's been like right about all of them. <laughs> like it just builds credibility uh, for that reason. Laura, a question for you. Um, Doc McGee, mm-hmm. uh, manager for the hair bands, created this Say No to Drugs tour for this yeah. like Moscow music festival, which was crazy. Yeah. Also, though, has like a naughty freaking backstory. Uh, he got an amazing deal. Do you think that perhaps... He was working for the government 
And that's kind of why some of this stuff ended up happening. Like one of my burning questions is, why did this band record this song in Russian? Whose idea was that? Was that Doc McGee's idea? Because the CIA told him. I found myself with a lot of questions. What about you? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, that's the thing, you know, listening to this. When we're talking about like what's what's plausible and what's what's not listening to this, like how far-fetched is this theory? I mean, I go back to that documentary we watched a while back where that guy was on the quest to find out if his father falling out the window was actually a suicide or was related to the CIA when they were Wormwood. Like, yes. So th- it's not totally far-fetched to think that the CIA was involved in some weird dealings at that time with people that they were roping in to help them out. When I heard then Doc McGee's story, and I'm like, so everybody else went to jail. Hmm. And he was like, just like doing concerts in Russia. And then mysteriously, the song uh, comes from that. I mean, it does seem kind of interesting. Mm. And, and even now when you hear like, like the, the buildup when, when he goes to go see him at his, his place in Florida, like Doc McGee's um, doing pretty well for himself. So I, I don't know if I buy into the whole like, you know, the CIA wrote the song, but I do feel like that perhaps they might have worked through this guy to, you know, from what you're what you're hearing in this to kind of influence opinion at the time by positioning people to be in the right places at the right time with the right message to sway things the way that you wanted to go. Because it doesn't make any sense to me, you know, why why he didn't go to jail, why nothing else happened to him. I want to know who gave them the idea to record it in Russia. That's what I just said. You know? Whose idea was that? That doesn't surprise me at all. Why, did they record all of their songs in Russian, Toby, or just this one? No, but but they, they record one about Russia in Russian after playing in consecutive years, playing these concerts where they show up for the first one and they're just like, you know, we're just going to play our tunes. Nobody's going to know what they are, but they're gonna just going to be jacked up to have like Western rock and roll. Oh, Toby. And then they start playing. You snowflake. And like. <laughs> My God, Toby. The invisible hand <laughs> led them there. Come on. I, I've, I'm, I'm losing your criticism of this. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just think they're the scorpions. Like yeah. their music's ridiculous. And they show up and means so much to all these people. And I think that's kind of what moved him to write Wind of Change. And then I think he was like, I want to get this across to Russians. I want them to be able to hear it. I mean, I that one part where they're like, I can't remember who it was, said, have you ever listened to the words of Rock You Like a Hurricane? And they're just, they're completely ridiculous. Yes. Like they're misogynistic and ridiculous. And so I would just think that if that was your life, was playing this kind of ridiculous music and you're like sort of a poor man's German ACDC, and then you show up in this, like the second most powerful country in the world and people somehow know your music, even though it's outlawed there. Like that to me, I would think would be a pretty like shocking experience. And I think for some, I mean, Klaus Minus seems like a little bit thoughtful. And in my, my picturing it is him being like, oh shit, like this is pretty wild. Like I'm just writing these fucking ridiculous songs about whatever. They don't really mean anything, but they, they clearly there's some connection here for these people who are like, super thirsty for this kind of stuff. I mean, that 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 was kind of my take. And I realize it's probably part of it's like listening to the Scorpions when I was 14. Yeah. Uh, and thinking they were cool. <laughs> but and, and then later reading an article about how like various parts of Spinal Tap were based on their antics. Yeah. So anyway, I mean, that's that's kind of why I, it didn't surprise me that they wanted to do it in Russian because I, I, I kind of felt like he... I would be surprised if I was in his position, I would have been pretty moved by the fact that all these people knew my music, even though it was illegal there at the time. I, I, I would have found it shocking. Kevin, you know that the uh, producer on this podcast, Henry, not our podcast on When to Change, Henry, mm. is the same producer who produced Dan Taberski's podcast. And there is the episode where they go talk to Klaus uh, the sort of climax of the story and in the hotel room and producer Henry is like, I don't like, you know, I like to have the microphones here, here, here and here and hear this whole conversation. And there's this brilliant piece of narration where Klaus is talking about finding the original lyrics and just out of nowhere is like. The good thing is that I put the date yeah. on there. That makes it so special. Is he hitting this a little hard at this point? Like he's maybe protesting too much. 
our Henry Lavoie made the note. Klaus, with his convenient date on the original lyrics, it's like the Kavanaugh calendar in the Supreme <laughs> Court confirmation <laughs> hearings. And we hear Patrick saying, like, you think he's leaning a little heavily on the fact that the date is on these lyrics? What do you think? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's confirmation bias, right? Because if yeah. you think that the, it's it's fishy, this origin story, right? It sounds totally confirmation biasy to support that, right? If he leads with, "Look, the date is on the lyrics." Well, look, it, it, this is all what it comes down to. Does he prove one way or the other that the CIA had a hand in the success of Wind of Change, and he doesn't? Is that okay? Yeah, I think in that way it shares the same benefit that Serial does. No, there isn't a definitive answer, but it was a really interesting journey. I think, though, he could have maybe shared a little more of his own suppositions. He did think about it for a year. I think it would have been okay for him to say, what I think happened. Mm. Um, well, Laura's going to do that for us. Laura, what right. do you think happened? Well, I would like to tell you my theory on this. So when I went down the rabbit hole listening to all of the hairband music, I found another song that was eerily similar to this song. And if you play them side by side, they might have been written by the same person because I listened to all the Scorpions music. I'm like, this doesn't sound like anything else, of course, because it was written by Klaus. I know exactly what song you're going to say. I think I do. Is it going to be Patience by Guns yes, N' Roses? Yes, by Guns N' Roses. Yes. yes, they're almost the same yes. song. And I'm like... Hello, I'm like, I would say Guns N' Roses has a better shot of having written this song than the Scorpions. I'm just saying, I once went to a Velvet Revolver concert. I may or may not have flashed my boobs at Slash. But, Whoa. Oh, wait, did I just say that out loud? Oh, my God. You did. Oh my God. <laughs> We're learning so much about you, Laura I Bricker. I think that they actually had something to do with this song. They are The two songs side by side had the same construction. They're very similar. They both open with protracted whistle solos. Yes. There are some similarities there. So, I so do you think Axel is the guy who was at that CIA dinner? <laughs> I think it's oh Axel Rose. Oh Ooh. my God! At the Watergate, at that guy's apartment. Yeah. yeah. Really interesting theory, Toby Ball. They did say he was American, didn't they? I can neither confirm nor deny. Okay, Patrick Radden Keefe has a season two here. I think he needs to ask the whose idea was it to write the song in Russian question, and he needs to ask was it Axl Rose at that apartment dinner? A hundred percent. I saw Guns N' Roses twice, and the first time Skid Row opened for him, and I'm pretty sure. Sebastian Bach came out screaming, hey, motherfuckers, uh, just like he did in Moscow. This just officially <laughs> turned into the whitest podcast on the internet right now. Just <laughs> FYI. <laughs> well, since everybody's got their hair growing long. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I hate hair band music so much, except for a little bit of Guns N' Roses here and there. I can't lie. So, Kevin, who's our next sponsor for this podcast? Oh, uh, we're sponsored by Quince. Quince, my favorite. Oh, my God, my favorite. Yeah, so. Um, That's where this is from. <laughs> this is Quince? Yes. I'm literally wearing a shirt from Quince right now. It's short sleeve, though. It's short sleeve. But it's not really great for autumn. <gasps> and now we need to make the shift. By Hell the way, yeah. how was that summer we just got through? Amazing. Uh, yeah, a little, a little eventful. So now it's time to sort of put summer behind and move on to fall, which is always kind of a challenge, like for your... Um, for your closet. Not for me when I have quins. You can get great deals on things like cashmere sweaters. Hell yeah. $50. Pants for every occasion, washable silk tops, and so much more. And the best part is that quince items, you know, they're priced about 50 to 80% less than similar brands, but they also work with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing practices, and premium fabrics and finishes. You know what I love? I'm going to rub your shirt here. This is like in this, an appropriate this is a place. lightweight, yeah, yeah, cotton yeah. shirt. I love that they show you like how much it would have cost elsewhere and like how why they've priced it the way they price it. And so you know exactly why you're getting the value that you're getting. But then when you get it, you're like, this seems way more expensive. They're cashmere sweaters, by the way. Gorgeous. Make switching seasons a breeze with Quince's high quality closet essentials. Go to quince.com slash crime, crime for free shipping on your order and 365 day returns. That's Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash crime, crime to get free shipping and 365 day returns. Quince.com slash crime. crime. Lemon, lime, and a drop of cherry make a simple Shirley. But what happens when Tito's handmade vodka reveals this sweet sipper's dirty secret? Stir up a Tito's dirty Sherlock and crack the case with Tito's at titosvodka.com. 
40% alcohol by volume, namely 80 proof. Crafted to be savored responsibly. Reese's peanut butter cups are the greatest, but let me play devil's advocate here. Let's see. So, no, that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> that's definitely not a problem. Uh, Reese's, you did it. You stumped this charming devil. All right. Well, I think we should do what we do. Let's let our listeners know, should they check out Wind of Change? It's available in its entirety right now on Spotify, but it is being released on all the apps, including Apple and Stitcher and anywhere you listen to your podcasts. It's an eight part series from Pineapple Street and Crooked Media and Spotify, uh, starring Patrick Radden Keefe, writer for The New Yorker. Laura Bricker, I'm going to start with you. What do you think? Thumbs up or thumbs down for this podcast? Uh, This is a big thumbs up. I listened to this all in one day while I was doing all my little house projects last weekend. And it's it's a really fun, interesting listen. I've been telling all my, like everybody that I see or talk to this week, I'm like, you should listen to this podcast. It's so interesting. You've got nostalgic hairband music. You've got spies, international adventures, crazy characters, and that guy, Michael, who is Patrick Radden Keefe's friend that I totally want to be friends with too. So I would say, listen to it. Toby Ball, what about you? Thumbs up or thumbs down for Wind of Change. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like Patrick Radden Keefe wins the uh, Toby Ball Man of the Year Award. <laughs> yeah, it was very coveted award too. Yeah, well, it's the first. <laughs> who, was, who, who was the runner up for that award? <laughs> no, but Say, say Nothing was uh, just a great book. And then he follows up with this podcast, which I think... Was it Reply All? What was the thing that had the the guy who couldn't remember the the song? That yeah. was Reply yeah. All. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that was a Reply All, and where people were like, you know, is this the greatest podcast episode ever? But I, I kind of feel like this is a great story for podcasting. Mm-hmm. He found a story. I mean, he's he's generally a print person. Uh, realized it was a great podcast story, and then for a guy who ha- hasn't done podcasts before, really figures out how to how to really use podcasting for ways in that it's different than print. And I think if this had been like a magazine article or something, it might have felt like, why are we going, why are we talking about this? Why are we talking about this? Why are we talking about this? But because, you know, so much of it is these super interesting interviews with with people whose stories you're interested in hearing, um, and he ties it back enough to what's what the center is, it's not like the perfect podcast, but I think it sort of perfectly understands what the possibilities are for podcasts versus other forms of, of you know, this kind of thing, like, I guess, magazine articles or books. So anyway, uh, it's a long way of, of saying uh, thumbs up. Uh, I thought it was really good. We'll recommend it to a lot of people. And, uh, you know, hopefully he has got the bug and will stick around and do some more things in between writing for The New Yorker. And being on the deep dive. What about you, Kevin Flynn? I am a thumbs up. I thought this was a really great journey. The question is just so interesting. And unlike anything else that we've been presented before, I will say that the song did get in my head, Wind of Change, I hadn't heard in Earworm. many, many years. Yep. And I, I couldn't even tell you if I've ever heard it start to end. Uh, and I thought like we you'd get burned out on it. But for some reason, even that, they played just enough of it here and there. That you remember it, but you're not burned out. Like they did that in uh, the thing you do. Mm-hmm. Like it's all built around one song, and you're going to keep showing them playing it. But you know they held enough of it back that in the end, the big finale is, oh yeah, I want to hear this whole song now. So anyway, uh, good job with uh, Wind of Change. Yeah, I can't say enough good things about this podcast. You know, I started the review of the first podcast in this episode by saying like this was a very uninteresting podcast because the story is so low stakes, like who cares? This question that Patrick Radenke throws at us, like, honestly, let's be real, like, who cares, right? Except it's not only about that. That is a framework to have us learn about the CIA. Ultimately, there's this incredibly literary scene near the end of the podcast uh, that really makes the listener realize, is this show really just about the nature of conspiracy and what we want to explore, why we want to explore it, and whether or not we propagate that conspiracy by actually asking these questions? So interesting. I just want to give a hat tip to Henry Malofsky and Pineapple Street Media. I've said this on the show before. I will say it again. I can't say it enough. 
Pineapple Street is the studio that is making podcasts right now that when I hear they may are making something, I cannot wait to listen to it. There is no other production house right now that I can say that about reliably. Pineapple Street is right now the HBO or the whatever is better than HBO of podcasting, just the excellence of not just the storytelling and the writing, but the seamlessness of the mixing, the beauty of the production. Everything is just put together perfectly. I loved this podcast. I found myself wondering sometimes, like, why do I love this? But then I kept listening, and that tells me it's a podcast worth listening to. So huge thumbs up for me for Wind of Change. Man, that was a fun one. It was. I mean, Toby still loves that I one. I loved and- that podcast. I think about it all the time. They don't make enough shows like that one with low stakes that are just sweeping and spend lots of money investigating something that doesn't fucking matter. I loved it. I yeah. loved it. I wonder sort of looking back and we've compared these two things that we've had. I mean, there have been certainly more conspiracy podcasts. Where the journey is just like, we just know it's not going to go anywhere. At the end, we're just not going to find out that, you know, X, Y, or Z happened. And this was one where we were okay with the fact because of the strength of the storytelling. Right. And the, um, you know, the uniqueness of the idea. Right. The premise that we were like, thumbs up. But since then, we've had a lot that, I, I don't know, I wouldn't say maybe that they're better, but they're similar that they're trying the same thing and they just don't land the same. Yeah, but the thing is, how much did we learn listening to this podcast about the CIA and how they operate? A lot, right? Ah, uh, yes. CIA is shady as hell. They depose presidents. They interfere in elections. They did do propaganda with the arts. And we yeah. learned all of that in this podcast. It's so good. And then the whole side stuff. Uh, I loved it. Right. I loved it. I, I want to go on again. tour with Bon Jovi and whoever else was on that stupid plane. Exactly. Yeah. All right, Kevin, does that do it for us? It does. Well, let's wrap it. This show was recorded in Studio C, The Closet, in a New Hampshire basement that is actually a CIA operations center whose patriotic mission is to take down bad podcasts. On behalf of all the crime writers, thanks so much for listening. We'll catch you later. Later. Crime crime media. Media. Mom, Dad, I humbly suggest you save some money and shop Amazon for back to school. It's for my growth, meaning my body's growing at an alarming rate. And clothes you buy me this year will be very small very soon. Plus, the clothes I love today will be out of style tomorrow. But at least your wallet doesn't have to be my fashion victim if you shop low prices for school at Amazon. Hopefully this is helpful. Amazon. Spin less, smile more.